Hello and welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith. And this week, I'm joined by co-host Jay Shabbat to discuss the latest earnings at Spirit Airlines and also the latest results from Japan's main carriers. Hey, Jay, how's it going? I'm good, Gordon. How are you? Doing very, very well. The sun's back in Portugal, so I am delighted. It was horrible last week. I had family visiting, friends visiting, and they were like, where's the sunshine? No reason to come here if it isn't sunny. That's obviously not true. It's a great place, come rain or shine. But uh, the sun certainly helps. Yeah, and I'm glad it's turned uh, turned nice uh, here here in uh, suburban Philadelphia as well. Well, we are going with a bit of trans-Pacific flavor with our uh episode this week. We are going to start by looking at spirit and boy, is there a lot to talk about there. Uh, and then we're going to turn our attention in part two to Japan, which is a fascinating market at any point, in my opinion, but particularly so right now, some themes we will discuss in a bit more detail. Let's kick us off, Jay, without further ado, Spirit Airlines, they posted their earnings. What on earth's going on? Ooh, uh, yeah, let's uh, brace all of our listeners here. This is not going to be pretty. You may want to... Uh... Fasten your seatbelts for this one. Uh, I'll start by saying that uh, Spirit in 2022 and 2023 alone, $519 million in operating losses. That's uh, quite, quite a hefty sum, even, even for a giant airline, let alone one that's rather modest in size, about 200 airplanes. Uh, and 2024, uh, off to another very bad start, $176 million operating loss. In the uh, in the first quarter, and these, by the way, are all uh, X special items. But when you're talking numbers this bad, it's uh, almost almost doesn't matter what what you include and what you don't include. It's uh, it's it's all just very very nasty. Uh, now let's go back in history. Uh, Ten years ago, so t- uh, 2014, uh, this was an airline that had a 19 percent operating margin, and that was actually. Uh, <laughs> That was actually pretty low relative to what was coming in 2015 and 2016. It actually had operating margins of over 20%. So this is Spirit Airlines was one of the most profitable airlines in the world for, for quite a stretch. And it did so with this uh, almost Ryanair-like model. I mean, you have to, you don't want to make that comparison too closely because uh, the European and U.S. airline markets are very, very different in many respects in terms of, you know, labor and airports. Uh, very, very different situations, but a little bit of that, you know, Ryanair, uh, you know, super emphasis on on low cost and getting a lot of uh, your revenues from from ancillary sales, and it worked like a charm. Uh, but then the pandemic hit, and well, that was you know a couple a couple of really awful years for everybody. But whereas some other airlines have recovered, a lot of these ultra low cost carriers haven't. Uh, we know Frontier hasn't. Allegiant is doing a little better, but uh, you know they reported earnings as well this week. Um, they were a little bit better, but uh, but still they're not you know not doing what they what they used to, but they're typically uh, you know typically inclined to doing. And uh, you know here we are, Spirit negative fourteen percent operating margin for the first quarter. So it, it's bad. <laughs> it's uh, no there's there's really not too much uh, pleasant you can say here. And is it a simple, well, there's no such thing as a simple case, but is it a simple-ish case of putting the planes in the wrong places, the oversaturated markets, the high leisure markets that worked great during the pandemic when people couldn't go too far, maybe traveling regionally as opposed to internationally, but now everyone's there, everyone's done it. What's going on? Is it is it as simple as that? Yeah, well, that's, that's a part of it. And, and let's just, let me say that uh, from... Since 2019, so in the past five years, Spirit Airlines has increased its, its ASMs flown, so the actual flown ASMs as reported, by almost 40%, four zero. So they've grown tremendously uh, in the past five years. And, and I guess in one sense, you can say, well, if you divide 40 by five, that's you know 8% a year. It's not that crazy. But let's also remember that costs for the industry have gone up dramatically. Spirit alone, you know, their labor costs are up uh, t- about 10 or 11%, I believe, year over year. That was in the first quarter. And if you go back, compare the first quarter of 2024 versus 2019, labor costs have more than doubled. So to grow that rapidly uh, in a situation where your costs are, are growing that much, um, you, you can see where it's they would have difficulty in obtaining the necessary yields to overcome those higher costs. Now, if you 
compare that to, for example, a Delta or American, their capacity is only up like two or three percent for 2019. United a little bit more, Southwest a little bit more, but the only one that's really even close to to Spirit is is Frontier. They're they're also up. Uh, I don't know, it's like 50, 60 percent. So, and those incidentally are the two airlines struggling the most, other than Hawaiian. Anyway, they've got unique problems. But uh, so you know, we can start uh, in trying to solve this puzzle here. We can start by perhaps hypothesizing that Spirit just simply grew too fast. So that's, you know, a start. Yep. And then to your point, you know, they weren't alone in growing too fast. A lot of their competitors grew in markets like Florida and Las Vegas, some of their biggest markets. Spirit's busiest airport, by the way, is, is Fort Lauderdale. I think a couple of years ago it was is Orlando. You know, those, it's, it's basically the very, very Florida heavy uh, airline. Las Vegas is, is up there as well. Um, and so they've just experienced a lot of, uh, yield pressure because of all that new capacity. And as I mentioned, it's, you've got all this, you know, all these, this higher cost base. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't bode well when your yields are under pressure. Um, they got a little bit lucky with fuel. Now fuel is, has been staying, you know, helpfully below a $3 a gallon mark and, that's somewhat manageable. Remember that if you look at um, 2002, 2022, sorry, that was the year that, uh, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine and oil prices, jet fuel prices in the spring of that year were actually over $4 a barrel. So, um, you know, to be under three is, is you know, that, that's helping a lot. And, you know, s- during the course of this whole, you know, a spirit has reported loss after loss. There has been, you know, speculation that maybe this airline would have to file for bankruptcy, especially since they do have a lot of debt. Uh, the I have the number here. I think it's like seven or eight billion. Um, don't have it directly in front of me, but it's a uh, you know tremendous amount of debt that they're going to have to service. And and people have been asking me, particularly like in a leasing aircraft lessors, have been asking asking me, you know, my opinion. Do they do I think that Spirit's going to go bankrupt? And, and and I you know without crunching numbers at a very detailed level. I think just in general, my sentiment is that they probably, you know, things sort of remain as is. They'll they'll be able to manage through the situation, especially since there's a lot of, you know, whether it be Pratt Whitney or other shareholders that, you know, they don't want to see their important spirit's an important customer. They don't want to see them go. So they probably get financial, you know, help uh to 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 avoid you know, having to file chapter 11. But at the same time, you know, I always warn people that if fuel does go over $4 a barrel again, they are in a very vulnerable position. So we're, uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit about their, their situation. I don't, I don't think that bankruptcy is imminent, but it is on people's radars. We should say that uh, Ted Christie previously fired back at the comments from some Wall Street analysts, calling them a, quote, misguided narrative. Uh, but it's 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 uh, it's a real issue they've got. I think around 1.1 billion dollars in debt set to mature in 2025. Um, obviously, the airline's been forced to forge that standalone path now after the failed merger with JetBlue. Jay, there were comments from uh, Ted Christie on the analyst call earlier this week, and we should say that we're recording on Wednesday afternoon, my time, Wednesday morning with you, Jay, uh, about the, the failed merger with JetBlue and that shareholders rejected Frontier's bid. Here's a quote for you from Christie's call earlier in the week. Quote, in the beginning of our consolidation process in 2022, we advocated strongly for a merger between the two largest ULCCs and tried to outline the challenges with the proposed JetBlue transaction. But our shareholders did not listen. We told you so. I see him wagging his finger. Yeah, is is this sort of like a a teacher giving the the naughty pupil a, a telling off, or is there a bit more we can read into this, or is this just the frustrations of a an airline CEO that's got a lot to deal with? Yeah, well, they are frustrated. I mean, they they he's he's right to say that they did uh, you know support the Frontier merger and JetBlue eventually. Uh, you know, they, they kept raising raising the bid and made it to where uh, you know the, the shareholders decided that. JetBlue is just the more lucrative offer, but yeah, they, you know, Spirit and Ted Christie and Spirit, they were originally warning that uh, this, this uh, might 
have uh, antitrust issues, and they were right. So uh, here they are. Now it's you know small consolation now that they're stuck having to figure out what to do. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I think it's important to note that during the the period in which uh, the two airlines were waiting for the judge's decision, Spirit was under contract uh, with JetBlue. They had some uh, restrictions on what they can do, you know, and, and you can understand why JetBlue would impose something like that. They they weren't allowed to just you know radically change the airline anyway or do anything too, you know, uh, out of the ordinary. Um, so their their hands were kind of they, they were a bit handcuffed. Let's ju- let's just say that now that the merger is dead and done, they can take some more dramatic steps to try to turn the ship, so to speak. Uh, and most interestingly, I think is that they uh, you know for well for one they they are actually furloughing furloughing a couple hundred pilots. Um, and, uh, they're, you know, making other capacity cuts. I mean, they've pulled out of some markets like Denver and Aguadilla and Puerto Rico and, and, and a few others. Um, they've cut a lot in certain places like slashed our capacity in Atlanta, for example, and even Orlando. So they've done that. But I think most interestingly, I think during in the earnings call, what Christy said was that, or, or at least he didn't say it directly, but he sort of hinted that, Hey, look, our product may not be uh, perfectly aligned to how consumers have changed since the end of the pandemic. And what he's clearly referring to is that American travelers have been much more uh, willing to pay extra for comfort, for extra perks, for extra convenience. And Spirit doesn't have that. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of lo- known as the, you know, very... You know, all you get is your seed and you got to pay everything, you know, extra for everything. And they, they have home of the bear fair. They have the, yeah, that's a bear fair. Exactly. They do have that big front seat, but that's, you know, not, a, not a whole lot. Uh, I, lo- I love in the, in the marketing materials, <laughs> just as an outsider looking in, it's, you know, you describe it, Jay, aptly as a big front seat and you wonder, <laughs> Oh, you know, what, what do they call it as, you know, some sort of business plus or prestige brand, or how are they going to sugarcoat it? It's literally just called a big, big front, front seat, seat. in cap in in caps letters uh i guess it it does what it says it does right. it's a big front seat and you can see how they were really angling for that uh that image as uh hey we're gonna get you from point a to point b it'll be safe it'll be clean but otherwise you know no no perks and you know we don't want you to pay extra if you don't need to if you don't badly need extra space and you don't badly need to check that extra bag we're not going to charge you for it and you know give them credit that worked brilliantly as i just mentioned earlier <laughs> they had a 24 percent operating margin in 2015 <laughs> so and yes that was the year that fuel prices crashed but but anyway they were uh, you know consistently running double digit margins and it was a very successful airline but i don't think that marketing pitch really is, is working right now um i think they're like we said is they're, they're really and frontier has been doing the same thing by the way they're you know adding more business friendly fares and uh, a little bit, you know, adding a few perks here and there and, you know, things with their loyalty program. So spirit very strongly hinted that something is coming in, in, in that regard. You know, they're going to be chasing higher dollar passengers. Uh, can they successfully do that? You know, that remains to be seen, but uh, that is, that seems to be the plan. And just before we jump across the pond to Japan, Jay, what would you say to someone that's listening to this and saying, let's not give Spirit too hard a time? Q1's rough on almost every U.S. carrier. Yeah, well, well remember, there being a Florida heavy carrier, Q1 uh, shouldn't be so rough for them. And historically, it hasn't been. Uh, so they, um, you know, that's March is the probably the most profitable month of the entire year for uh, for for Florida. So, you know, they can't really use that as an excuse. Uh, now this uh, this particular Q1 should have even been better because it included the Easter holiday, uh, and um, yet it wasn't better. So, and by the way, if anybody is uh, you know thinking that oh things will get better in the second quarter, well they won't. They uh, Spirit actually says that during the second quarter, their operating margins are going to be. Let's see if I can find here between negative seven and negative nine percent, and that uh, involves a little bit of adjustment. They're going to get some credits uh on future engine purchases from pratt and whitney because of all that's happening with these gtf groundings so much more we could discuss and i'm sure we will revisit spirit and the the ultra low cost scene in the u.s 
in a not too distant episode, but do stick around. Don't go anywhere. In part two, we are going to be looking at uh, news from Japan. Be right back. Hello and welcome back to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith. This week, I'm joined as usual by co-host Jay Shabbat. Part one, we were discussing spirits. And I promised when I started this podcast to myself that I would not use the word turbulence Mm -hmm. to describe any sort of industry problems. Um, So cliche. So cliche. I'm like, turbulence, guys, anything like that, you know, that's... It's beyond us, quite frankly. Uh, But I came really, really close in part one to using the T word. So... uh, I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, bumpy skies. Bumpy skies. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Anyway, we digress. Uh, let's talk about Japan, Jay, because we've had some interesting numbers out of Japan Airlines and All Nippon. And yeah, for guys sitting here in Europe, Japan just seems like the most exciting place in the world. You know, the food, the vibrancy, those neon lights, the incredible nature the culture, the people, everything. It seems super exotic and it is super exotic. It's its a really great place to visit as an inbound visitor right now because the yen is particularly weak, less attractive for Japanese travelers going overseas. How is all of that playing out? What can you tell us about the uh, the latest earnings? Right, right. And uh, yeah, certainly that's a uh, what you mentioned is a very big part of the story, how uh, the yen being so weak Japan is becoming suddenly this rather inexpensive place to visit and a place that a lot of people want to visit. And so inbound tourism is surging. And uh, the two, there are two big Japanese airlines, All Nippon and Japan Airlines, and both are, uh, you know, doing the best they can to take advantage of that to try to capture overseas passengers. It's always actually a little more difficult if you're an airline to capture passengers uh, outside of your home territory, just because, you know, you're, you're naturally going to have a advantage at home with with your branding with your distribution channels with uh you know uh you know the market better whatever so um it is you know it, it is a bit of a challenge and uh they've they've done a few things to, to try to help them in that regard but let me just back up a minute and uh, go back to just just a very uh broad um history lesson here about the Japan Airlines and all the pond. I promise I'll be brief. But uh, so Japan Airlines, if you go back before the global financial crisis of like 2008, 2009, was a very troubled airline, but they went through a very cathartic kind of bankruptcy in, uh, in about 2010, I believe it was. And that really turned them very profitable. And they, throughout the 2010s, they were uh, one of the, you know, most profitable, let's call them global, you know, intercontinental airlines. They really had a great, great decade. Uh, on the pond was always uh, not quite as profitable, but they they were always kind of okay. You know, they've always had like a, like decent profit margins. Never really lost money. And, and on the pond, you know, traditionally was always the very domestic heavy carrier. Japan, the very heavy international. And over time, that's kind of uh, converged. Whereas now, they're they're basically like roughly even. They both, uh, I think very similar percentage of their ASMs comes from domestic and international for both of them now. Uh, now, what's happened with, with, with the two is that uh, since, since COVID, coming out of COVID, uh, this, the script has actually flipped, whereas All Nippon is now the more profitable airline than Japan again. And there are a few different reasons for that. If anybody read uh, the, the most recent issue of Airline Weekly, I believe it's the one that came out uh, this week, um, we talk about this a little bit more about why why that story has flipped, but uh, it does have something to do with Hawaii, which uh, you can you can read about. But uh, just to give you um, you know kind of where we stand uh, numbers wise and operating margin terms, uh, All Nippon had an eleven percent operating margin last year, and Japan Airlines was at eight percent, so you know perfectly respectable. Um, both of these airlines did lose money in the first quarter, but nothing abnormal there. It's off peak. Uh, and they seem to say that the uh, you know the upcoming spring and summer season uh, should be should be pretty good should be should be strong. Before we go any further, I just need to compliment A and A on the incredible liveries. And I know it's it's a long way from Wall Street and the analyst numbers and everything else, but they've got a Star, Star Wars one, don't they? The Star Wars stuff with R two D two. The yeah. Pokemon plane was incredible with all the you know, the Pikachu and all the the fun characters there. Yeah, if you look at regionally, I think yeah, it's um, Eva Eva Air, EVA Air out of 
Taiwan. They do the sort of Hello Kitty planes and right. things, which is really, really fun. And uh, yeah, just a shout out to whoever in, in ANA said, let's go crazy with the paint shop and just get these planes looking absolutely wacky. Um, there's actually, Gordon, there's actually kind of an interesting story behind that. It relates to what I was just talking about because on the pod, and I remember we we interviewed the C, the former CEO. This was going back probably, you know, I don't know, it was 10, 15 years ago. But one of the things he told us is that the All in the Pond brand, if you think about just the name, it doesn't resonate very well outside of Japan. A lot of people, you know, just don't really know, like, what is what is that? You know, it's not the country name. Whereas Japan Airlines has a much, you know, more easier to recognize name. And they've struggled with that. And All in the Pond has actually, they've, they've wondered, like, how could we uh, win better brand recognition abroad? especially, you know, it's, it's becoming ever more important, because as we said, we're getting more of these passengers that are visiting from abroad to coming to Japan. And one of the things that they've done is, is these like Star Wars liveries, as you said, the Pokemon liveries, that, that's kind of helped, you know, helped, helped with their brand identity. The other thing that they're doing, interesting, and it's just sort of the opposite of what all Japan Airlines is doing. So both airlines have started brand new sort of low cost wide body carriers. It's a little bit strange why they would do that. Um, Seems like, you know, that's, that's a strategy that hasn't worked well in the past for too many airlines. But, you know, they think they need to do it. And, and on the pond, interestingly enough, they named their new low-cost carrier Air Japan. <laughs> so not Japan Airlines, but Air Japan. So you can see where they're constantly trying to, uh, you know, uh, address that, that brand problem. Now, Japan Airlines did the opposite. They completely went away from the Japan, you know, the national theme, and they called their new airline Zip Air which I guess they thought appeals to people abroad. I don't know, I don't know if, that's a, if you like that name or not, uh, Gordon, but, uh, but they thought that was what would work best. It's all right. I mean, looking at the low-cost sphere, you've had Wiz, Wow. Yeah, there's, there's, there's sort of onomatopoeic. Wiz, Wow, Zip. Of, uh, it sounds like one of those, you know, those old Batman shows where like they, uh, when they throw a punch, they make the, uh, the, oh, yeah. uh, the, the, you know, the pow, yeah. bit, whiz, bang. Zip. You know, Jay, I'm old enough to remember Zoom as well, that uh, transatlantic effort across the Atlantic. In yes, there. yeah, Zoom, yeah. Early 2000s, late 90s. Anyway, we digress. Any insight as to how the Russian airspace closure is affecting these Japanese airlines? Because you know, it's, it's no longer possible to fly over the, the north of Russia, linking Frankfurt, London, whatever, with, with Tokyo and beyond. You now have to go the long way around. Any insight there, Jay? Did yeah, they so, mention anything? Right. So for sure. So if you're flying uh, to a lot of places in the U.S. Or, or especially Europe, you would fly over Russian airspace. Can't do that anymore. So it's definitely become uh, more costly. Um, the fuel burn has been, uh, you know, just, just goes up a lot. Um, but at the same time, fares have gone up a lot, too. Because, you know, what's happened is that so you could, if you wanted to go from Japan to Europe, for example, and you wanted to, you know, if, if you wanted to, you could go through Russian airspace if you connect on a Chinese airline, but you would have to connect. So most people are not going to do that. And besides, you know, most people, if you're a European or if you're in Japan, you're probably not going to, you're probably going to want to fly the local airline anyway, either, you know, Japanese airline, or if you're in Europe, you'll fly the European airline. So it hasn't really hurt that much. And even Finnair has said that as well. Finnair is like most dependent on Russian airspace of all the, uh, you know, of all the carriers affected by, uh, by the, by the Ukraine war. So they've even said the same thing, like, yeah, it's, it's bad. I mean, we lose a lot of aircraft time. It's costly, but we are getting, you know, we're getting the fares to compensate. So um, I, I wouldn't say that's a huge problem for, for the Japanese carriers. Also on ANA, the, uh, the A380 had a sort of micro resurgence with them, the, the three uh, flying Honu aircraft, which were going. Yeah, from, sp from, speaking from, of cool liveries, right? Didn't they paint one? Oh, of them? Yeah, the whale. Absolutely. And it's just shuttling back and forth between Hawaii and Japan, the, the uh, ANA three, I think, double deckers there. <laughs> Any indication as to how, how, how they're hurting? Because you've got this huge, ex relatively expensive aircraft shuttling back and forth on one route, really, because it is really designed for that trunk route between Hawaii and Japan and vice versa. A a any sort of indication from, from ANA on the call uh, how Hawaiian weakness is, is impacting them more broadly? 
Yeah, yeah, I think Hawaii is actually important to talk about. Um, and if you, you know, certainly read read uh, Airline Weekly, you get more detail on this. But um, a, a, a big part of, of the success at Japan Airlines in particular that I, that I mentioned earlier, uh, Hawaii, hard to know exactly how big how big a part of the story it is. But I tend to believe that it was a very, very profitable market and really helped Japan Airlines distinguish themselves, you know, margin wise through the course of the 2010s. They just had, they always had a lot more capacity to Hawaii than all Nippon. And they cooperated with Hawaiian Airlines. They still do cooperate with Hawaiian Airlines. They actually start, try to do a joint venture in the U.S. said, no, we can't do that. So a little bit of uh, what spirit is feeling in terms of, uh, you know, regulators stepping in and, uh, and uh, throwing cold water on the party, but uh, but 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 Hawaii has always been like really really profitable for them. But coming out of the pandemic, Japan tourism to Hawaii has really suffered a lot, and there's different reasons for it. The biggest probably being that you know the cheap yen. It's just if you, if you're paying in yen, going to a dollar based uh, place like Hawaii, it's going to be very very expensive. Hawaiian Airlines, uh, you know, this is a big reason why they're having so much trouble also because their their, their Japanese routes are, are struggling. And they've said that in addition to the cheap yen, uh, hotels in Hawaii have become really, really expensive. I think it's just difficult to build there. And um, yeah, just there's inflation and whatnot. Uh, so that's, that's, that's another reason uh, for why the Japan Hawaii market is struggling right now. You've also had, you know, fires in Maui and, and other reasons. Um, interestingly enough, so, so on the pond, they uh starting i would say i don't know 2018 2019 maybe maybe a little earlier they started looking at japan airlines and started getting a little jealous like whoa we <laughs> we've got to get a piece of this hawaii action too so they went out and got these old skymark uh a380s i don't know if you remember skymark They're still around actually yeah i do yeah. yeah and skymark is actually a publicly traded airline and i can tell you they had a five percent operating margin so they're not doing really well but they are profitable that was last last year uh and skymark was a completely reckless uh crazy airline that went out and bought a380s um bankrupted themselves and then on the pond went in there and kind of you know picked them up on the cheap uh and was able to deploy them to hawaii you can see where you know a380s as terrible as the economics on that thing are you can see Hawaii would be, you know, if you had a depreciated one or <laughs> one that wasn't, uh, you know, didn't cost you a lot, you could see Hawaii would be the place to put it because you can just, you know, fill the seats with with a uh, pretty high fare, actually, leisure, leisure passengers. Um, so that's what they've tried. But of course, now they're, you know, in a situation where the demand is is, is weak. And, uh, you know, Hawaiian Airlines and their call said that the, the market is starting to come back. So, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be better. I, I did look at... Uh, Japan Airlines, I was actually looking at their load factors to Hawaii in the first quarter. And they, they were, the load factors are okay. I mean, I can imagine the yields are way down, but they were in, you know, in the mid, mid high seventies. Uh, whereas like last year at this time, they're in the sixties is really, really bad. So Hawaii is, uh, you know, it's, it turned into be this, like being this like super all-star market to now more of a troubled market. And that's hurt JAL more than a &M. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit of summary of the Hawaii situation. Wow. Ending on a broadly positive note, a little bit of optimism for the Hawaiian market there, Jay. Thank you, as always, for your insights. And if you enjoyed our discussion on Spirit Airlines, I don't think Jay's going to kill me by saying uh, a little spoiler. This uh, next week's issue of Airline Weekly is going to deep dive into, into Spirit. So if you're a Spirit aficionado or if you know someone that is, uh, don't miss that. If you enjoy the podcast, why not consider a subscription to Airline Weekly, support our journalism. Visit airlineweekly.com forward slash subscribe to get a free issue, uh, a sample issue, and explore what all the fuss is about. And don't forget, you can always contact us via email. My address is gs at skiff.com. That's G for Gordon, S for Smith, and J can be reached via js at skiff.com. That's J for J and S for Shabbat. We welcome any story ideas, tips, comments, complaints, everything in between. We are a... Uh, a very open-minded bunch. Uh, my thanks to Jay for joining me this week, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.